Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy to be with you. Um, Finally, it's been a minute. It's been a weird, a weird couple of months, as you know. I I just counted and um, I know I say this, I keep saying this because I, I think I'm trying to make it real to myself. It's still very surreal, the fact that we moved to Portugal. But we did that March 3rd. We, we left California March 2nd. We arrived March 3rd. And then three weeks later, on March 22nd, I flew back to Montana. I left here March 22nd. I got to Montana March 23rd. And then I flew back to Portugal on April 13th left Montana on April 13th, got back to Portugal on April 14th. And I don't know what time zone I'm in. <laughs> I think so. Now I've been back here for about three weeks. So it was three weeks, three weeks, three weeks. Um, and just a lot of a lot of international travel. I don't know that I um, I don't know how people do it. How do people who travel internationally do it? Because I just want to sleep for like a week after each flight. But anyway, I'm back. I think I'm finally settled in. Um, Obviously, still deeply missing my dad. Uh, It's hard. It's it's hard because I'm here, and so it feels like dad's just at home with mom, right, in Montana, and I'm here, and I'll call home and talk to both my parents, and and that's not the case. So it hits me. It hits me at at odd times, Um, and it's, it's still pretty hard, of course. It's only been a month, but... At any rate, I'm so grateful to have this podcast and you, all of my listeners and the authors that I talk to, I've met so many amazing people and I'm just grateful for everything that happens with this podcast. So thank you for that. And let's talk about books. Let's talk about one book in particular, of course, because today's interview with is with author Joe Lee. We have historical fiction again, but a different um a different format than I than I often do. This one is a graphic novel, and this is the first graphic novel. This is the first interview I've done for a graphic novel. So, the book is called Forgiveness: The Story of Eva Core, Survivor of the Auschwitz Twin Experiments. Again, the author is Joe Lee, and here is the description from the back of the book. In March of 1944, at age 10, little Eva was arrested with her entire family including her twin sister Miriam, for the crime of being Jewish. Nazis loaded Eva and her family on into a cattle car with other men, women, and children headed to the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. Within moments of their arrival, the twins lost their entire family to the gas chambers without a chance to say goodbye. Because twins were considered valuable for research, the girls were spared immediate death by Joseph Mengel, the Nazi doctor and war criminal, in favor of experimentation and torture. This stunning, heartbreaking illustrated biography tells the story of a tenacious girl's fight to survive a horrific childhood ravaged by tragedy, her growing anger as an adult who settled in Terre Haute, Indiana, and her eventual discovery that forgiveness might just save her life. So again, that is the description of... um, Forgiveness, the story of Eva Kaur, survivor of the Auschwitz twin experiments. It is, uh, it's it's heartbreaking. Of course, it's heartbreaking. The story is heartbreaking. Um, Hard to read at times. I think Joe does a beautiful job of telling the story in a way that's accessible, especially in this different format. You know, every, lots of people read in different ways, and so a, a graphic novel might draw people in who may not normally be as interested in history or find history easy to read or, or 
access because as you as you know i'm sure history textbooks can sometimes be pretty dry i think they they're getting better i hope they're getting better um, but Joe just does a, a really good job of making this accessible and, and the pictures. He's, he's so thoughtful in how he pairs the story and the pictures. So um, history, of course, is important all the time. But I, I just feel like right now this, this story is, is especially important in light of so many things going on in the world. And to read, not only to remember history and past events, but also to hear Eva's message of forgiveness and, and figure, you know, where can we apply that in our lives? What are areas of our own lives where we need to forgive, be forgiven, etc. So um, let's go ahead and turn to the interview with Joe so he can tell more about the process and why this book came into being and how it was putting it together. Uh, again, Forgiveness, the story of Eva Kaur, survivor of the Auschwitz twin experiments. The author is Joe Lee. Hi, Joe. Welcome to the podcast. Well, hello, Sarah. It's so nice to be here with you. It's great to have you here, and I'm excited to talk about your book. Um, it's called Forgiveness, and then there's a, a longer subtitle, which we'll talk about in a minute. But before we get to the book, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about yourself, um, that would be wonderful. Well, I um, actually graduated from Indiana University with a degree in history, but I have been somebody who has drawn pictures since I was, a, well, as long as I can remember, and then seriously started doing it at about eight or nine. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit. Um, but after college, I did a graduate program, which really, it was a graduate program for me, um, in the hardest college at the time to for anybody to get into. And this is based on statistics, which was, um, Ringling Brothers Clown College. So I graduated from Ringling Brothers and then had a um, career for a few years um, working as a circus clown in, in various circuses. And uh, then after that, I devoted myself more and more to, um, you know, art uh, in a two dimensional form. And um, have been doing that ever since with a, primarily a, a focus on uh, cartooning and specifically editorial cartooning and book illustration, as well as, um, you know, sometimes to draw some illustrations, you need to write the book. So that's, that's where I am. That is, I have, I have so many questions. We could spend, you know, uh well, a long time just talking about your experience um, with Ringling Brothers, but probably people are here to hear about the book. <laughs> but I'm just saying I could I could ask a million questions. <laughs> yeah. um, that had to have been a, just a really unique experience for you. Well, it, it, it was a, one of those very formative experiences that um, I think it's always a, not exactly um, Joseph Campbell's you know, the hero's journey, but in, in a small way, it was. It's that, that you leave what is comfortable and recognizable, and you go into a world that is very different, seemingly, than the one that, you're, that you have grown up in. But in the end, I think you realize <laughs> that all worlds are very much the same. Mm. <laughs> I did it in makeup. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. Yeah. Um, I love the comparison to the hero's journey. That's that's really cool. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about the book. It, it is called, as I said, Forgiveness, um, the story of Eva Kaur, survivor of the Auschwitz, Aus, Auschwitz, excuse me, twin experiments. Could you just give um, a, an overview of the story and a little bit about Eva? Yes. Um, Eva, as a 10-year-old all right, sorry. Start again, please. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, well, as a 10-year-old twin, Eva and her family were um, taken to Auschwitz. And it's uh, the story really is what happened to so many people 
Uh, it's both general in that what happened to all these groups, the Jews, the Roma people, uh, homosexuals, Jehovah Witnesses, but then the specific story of this little Jewish girl who grew up in a small village in Transylvania, uh, Romania, the only Jewish family, and as uh, the world started to change around her family, uh, how they eventually ended up in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And the only thing that saved Eva's life and her twin sister Miriam was the fact that they were indeed identical twins and they were picked out on the selection platform uh, to go into um, Dr. Joseph Mengele's uh, twin experiments and which were, you know, experiments uh, is the formal term, but certainly bizarre tortures would probably better explain what Mengele was doing. And um, within moments of arriving in Birkenau, the, the rest of the family, the two older sisters and Eva's mother and father were taken to the uh, gas chambers. And, but Eva and her sister, and Eva was, to have met her was a, a wonderful thing. She was one tiny, spirited, alive person. And she decided that she was going to do whatever she could to save herself and her sister's life, which um, she did. They were in Auschwitz, Birkenau for a total of 10 months and then were liberated uh, by the Soviet troops coming from the East. And, uh, you know, and the story goes on from there about how this trauma, and of course, this incredibly terrible trauma that affected her the rest of her life, both um, it, it really affected her sister medically, but just the psychological trauma and how eventually Eva managed to find a way to, you know, rise above the, the her earlier terrible experiences. And it was through forgiveness, uh, a subject that so many other people, I think, um, I always think of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu as another great kind of apostle mm -hmm. of, of forgiveness, that it is a way not just of, it, it's never to erase the past, or, but it's a way to recognize the past and not let the past completely and totally subject one in the present. And so it was, um, it's, she had a remarkable journey. And for me as a illustrator and somebody who loves the form of graphic stories that it begged for me to try my hand at telling her story. Absolutely. I mean, the fact that you uh, you have a history degree and you are an artist, um, a visual artist, makes perfect sense for you to write this story in this way. It's time for our first break of the podcast, although um, listening to my last comment, I'm now thinking maybe I should rethink my history degree. I can't draw, so I can't. I, I, I definitely can't be a graphic artist, but, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, I have a history degree. I have not written a graphic novel or any other kind of a novel uh, that's beside the point anyway <laughs> i'm just sitting here thinking hmm, what should i do what should i be doing with my history degree let's go ahead and take our first break when we come back we'll be talking more about how this novel came into being so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back 
GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking, as you know, with author Joe Lee. We are discussing his new graphic novel that uh, depicts the life of Eva Kaur. So let's go ahead and return to that interview. What led you to um, deciding to write Eva's story? Uh, Obviously, it's remarkable, but um, what was the impetus that led you to write the story? Well, she... um... Actually, I live in Bloomington, Indiana, and Eva, oh, in the, um, you know, after marriage, she ended up in Terre Haute, Indiana, because her husband, Mickey Core, who actually um, just died a few months ago, uh, had been liberated. He was uh, in to the West in a camp, and he had been in various Uh, concentration camps, but he was liberated by American troops, one of whom was an officer, an American officer from Terre Haute, Indiana. And the officer took a real liking to Mickey and told him, if you are interested, I will sponsor you to come to the United States to finish your high school education And then um, Mickey went to a Purdue University and became a pharmacist. And he was visiting relatives years later in Israel, and he met Eva. And so they got married, even though um, Eva spoke no English or uh, Latvian or anything which was, uh, and spoke primarily Hebrew and Hungarian and, but they fell in love, married, and through the years uh, being settled in Terre Haute, I mean, she was, her past kept coming to visit her and eventually she started talking about it and eventually built a museum, the Candles Museum, and that exists still in Terre Haute. It's a wonderful facility. And she would find every opportunity to meet uh, interested people who would come to the museum. And twice a week, she did talks about her past and how she came to this forgiveness. And it was at one of those, my wife uh, was involved with the um, Lilly Teachers Endowment and teaches uh, art as as just an enjoyable activity to school teachers uh, uh, during the summer. And she had always, and that is in Terre Haute at Indiana State University, they do that. she had been invited at several different times to come and hear Eva, but wasn't able to. And finally, she did. And she heard Eva speak. And she said, she called me immediately after and said, Joe, really, you've got to come and hear her. And there have been, you know, quite a few different graphic depictions of the Holocaust, um, primarily Mouse by Art Spiegelman that has uh, won the Pulitzer Prize Mm -hmm. and recently in the news again because of of bizarrely being banned. Um, (laughs) I mean, it's uh, the the leap in any kind of logic is 
much more <laughs> than I can ever imagine. I agree. But uh, I have friends um, who are live in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh, of course, suffered a terrible tragedy with the Tree of Life um, massacre uh, at the synagogue. And um, some my friends there that teach at the University of Pittsburgh, one of whom has always been involved in comic books and comic book culture, told me that a group of Pittsburgh illustrators and writers were writing and putting together a series of comic books of short vignettes of local Pittsburgh, primarily uh, Holocaust survivors. And so I looked at those and I just thought this, uh, the story of Eva, the entire arc of her story really begs for a longer treatment than an eight page comic story. So I came back there and when I eventually did get to hear Eva, I already had this idea in mind. And of course, Eva, very gregarious, always gathered a crowd. So she spoke for two hours and taking questions and was um, just an incredible speaker and life force. But I didn't want, I thought I wouldn't take her time to tell about my personal project that I wanted to do with her. So I presented it to the um, interim museum director, Leah Simpson, who's there as now as the education director. And um, so Eva was always and ready and willing to spread the story of what had happened to her and her sister and her family and the uh, Jews of Europe to a wider audience so we would never ever forget, but also to find a way to deal with this uh, terrible tragedy. And um, I kept trying to arrange an interview with Eva, but she underwent heart surgery and she, and the folks at the museum said, you know, you should wait till she's stronger. So I got a um, grant from the Indiana Arts Commission and every year, Eva would take trips with interested groups from the Candles Museum to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And so I got a grant which helped pay for me to go with this specific trip in mind. And so finally, I was able to speak, you know, to get to know Eva a little bit better. But um, she died on the trip um, on July 4th, um, a several days after we had gotten there. She had been there the week before with a larger group of high school students. And it was that hottest summer in Europe. And she had, you know, recently undergone a heart surgery. The, her health was very delicate. We were ask um, not to hug her um, and she was imminently huggable but because her health was so delicate and um, it was it was very sad but if anybody ever died with their boots on it was Eva because she spent July 3rd with us, the, this group um, talking and taking us around uh, Birkenau, which was the last place that she had seen almost all of her closest family. And she was filled with humor and intelligence and grace and cantankerous and she actually um, ate dinner with us that night. And then the next day, early that morning, she was gone. That's incredible. I mean, wow. Yeah. What, I, what a 
journey. I mean, obviously her journey is amazing, but what a journey for you also, it, just in terms of the process of writing this and being there with her uh, in her final days. Yeah, it, it was, uh, and I thought, well, maybe I will really start working on the, the book before I would try to get a grant and go on the trip. And my wife kept saying, don't put it off till next year. Do it this year. If, you, if you're really serious about it, do it. And of course, it's one of those things that, you know, those occurrences in life, um, it certainly was the right time to work on it. Absolutely. You mentioned a, a bit ago that you wanted it to be more than, you know, the eight pages that the, uh, that the other projects were working on. But can you talk a little bit about writing her story as a graphic novel, which is, I'm assuming, a very different process than writing, you know, a, a biography or a historical fiction. How was that process for you how, to decide what to include, what to not include, etc.? Yeah, it's, um, and it's one thing, and, and I've taught various uh, classes on cartooning and, and comics, and I always try to tell People, you know, try not to bite off more than you can chew, but challenge yourself to do this. And one thing that you can do in, a, in an illustration, you do, whatever you do in that drawing, you don't need to repeat in the text. And of course, there are parts of everybody's life and everybody's story that are much more whether easier to illustrate than they are to write about. And in fact, um, sometimes words can, it, well, it's, you know, the old adage that, uh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And sometimes that's true. Um, to draw a place like Auschwitz and Birkenau is, I mean, to show the, the starvation of somebody is easily described in a drawing. Um, and one doesn't need to over explain what was happening. Uh, and her story, there, there are parts of it that um, to remain true to it was an interesting process because I realized as I was drawing it, um, she has a, a son and daughter who are uh, live in the area and her son, Alex, I've, I've gotten to know. He's a wonderful gentleman. Um, but I was telling and in a graphic form, parts of a story that they had never actually seen. And it, to do something about somebody who in it, when I conceived the idea was still living, to tell their story in a way and remain true to it in that kind of graphic way. Because Eva told her story, she was easy to research because um, she, had talked about her story, the story had been written. There were a lot of, you know, kind of verbal exchanges about her and actually hearing her talk about her story and taking copious notes. It informs the drawings, but they aren't the drawings. So to actually go on the, the trips, and I went on a second trip just as COVID was happening, they, the museum was trying out an audio tour with her because, uh, as I say, she had spoken a lot. A uh, wonderful um, communications professor, Jess McDonald, who had been with her and involved in the museum for years, actually started putting together her story and then interviewing her for the pieces that weren't recorded to connect it. So I actually had access to that as well. Um, but, you know, 
one thing, there, there are a lot of archival illustrations and uh, photographs and films of the Holocaust experience. And in fact, that was where, you know, Eva had started going back to Auschwitz. And if you go to Auschwitz, they uh, want you to see in a, a theater they have, as you enter the uh, main compound of Auschwitz, which is, uh, and Birkenau, which is associated with, which is actually the, the primary death camp. But you see archival footage that the Soviet army made of the liberation. And Eva had seen that film several times and she asked if she could actually buy uh, a couple of the, you know, the physical versions of the film. One, so she could, she, she would have to show to interested groups and the other that she could cut it up to get particular stills from the film. And it was in that she realized she and her sister were actually in that liberation film. Mm -hmm. And so seeing herself and her sister leading this group of children at um, that, and it was actually, it was a couple of weeks after the liberation that the Soviets decided they would put together um, for propaganda purposes, uh, a film of the liberation. And so they had the children being held by nurses and, and being led out. And Eva, who had seen this film over and over and over, when she saw, she thought, wait, those two little girls in front are me and my sister. Wow. And so even in that, the, uh, the experience of seeing something, um, it could be described, but to actually see that picture. And in fact, she, on every trip, except the, her last trip, because she wasn't there that day, uh, that we went into one of the barracks in Auschwitz that they had, that photograph, uh, that little still from the film blown up, and Eva would always stand by it and point out she and her sister. Um, so it was incredibly important to her um, to see her, to, that it would put her in that place, in this, um, every other evidence that she had, but, but here she and her sister are. Um, and this, uh, so, and that kind of from that blossomed the rest of her testimony, but it was, um, but as I say, to actually be there and to sketch and to, to take photographs and take notes and then um, go through the, the visual archives and to be able to then place that. It's, um, it, it's, a, it's a different process than just writing because in some ways it's where you're using more senses <laughs> and the actual doing of the story. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to jump in here in the middle of an answer um, so we can take our second break of the podcast. And when we return, Joe will finish uh, this discussion of the answer to my last question. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
<laughs> From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Joe Kaur. Uh We are starting this next little bit with um, a comment from me, but not a question from me. So we're still in the discussion of the last question of writing a graphic novel and um, how much more personal of an experience that must be. So let's get back to the interview. I would imagine it's in some ways a lot more personal. It is, and there are, um, one thing I did is I really wanted to to place this story because it, it's, and especially these days with what we hear, you know, what's happening in Ukraine and to try to understand the history of Europe and especially Eastern Europe, um, it's, uh, I wanted to to show in that first 15 pages of the book, what led up to this family being taken to this terrible, terrible place. And so I wanted to to show a wider history than just, you know, the family in the village being taken away because we we so easily forget. And pictures are... um, a great way to do that. So I look through everything. Um, some of my drawings are quotes on other people's work, cartoons that were done at the time. Um, there's a, a drawing by George Groats, who was a World War I veteran and saw the, the devastation to the soldiers who had in, and one could put this in quotes, survived World War I. And then things like there is a, a painting by John Singer Sargent, who is much better known for his painting of Madam X that hangs in the Metropolitan Museum and his painting of socialites. But they, he did this massive painting that I quoted on the first page of these soldiers who have been blinded and some are wearing bandages around their eyes and some without, but this line with hand to shoulder, hand to shoulder, as they are being led off um, the battlefield. And it is an amazing and poignant uh, painting that it expresses visually what would take so many words to express, but but you can see this line of soldiers. And um, so I tried to quote where I could in that first section, um, some of the archival materials that do exist. Most of them are... Um, you know, anonymous at this point, various cartoons and things. But, you know, what happened to Europe and to see it in some ways when one sees the films and the photographs of what's happening in Ukraine, now it really brings home that the failures sometimes of this human experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um what do you hope that readers will take from the book? Well, that it's um, you know, one of the things, and this is where I really um, 
think a great deal about Desmond Tutu, um, who when talking to, you know, working to, to end apartheid in South Africa and being involved with um, Nelson Mandela and, and talking at great length with Mandela and the African National Congress that the only, that as apartheid ended and the terrible devastation that had been done to the black population and well, anyone of color, because to be Portuguese, uh, a Portuguese descent wasn't considered on the same level as Afrikaans descent. So they had so many different levels of prejudice worked into apartheid. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, Tutu could see that if revenge was allowed to happen, and even, you know, one could talk about justified revenge, that it could just spiral into yet more tragedy and bloodshed. And so he was really instrumental in setting up the Truth and Recognition uh, Commission. And I think a great deal of what Eva was talking about is in the same realm as the Truth and Recognition in South Africa, is that you have to, you have to deal with open eyes and open heart with the truth of what happened. You can't skirt away from it. You, you can't in any way, shape or form minimize it. You have to face it head on. And then you have to reconcile. And sometimes reconciliation is and well, sometimes it always is painful. And especially in these kinds of tragic, horrible situations, it's beyond pain. But if you can't reconcile, you can't go forward. Um, I recently heard um, oh, uh, one of the founders of the Lynching Museum in Birmingham, Alabama, an African-American lawyer, Brian Stevenson, um, in an in interview. And he talked about if we can't think that it is ever possible to change, we have no hope. And so being able to forgive and reconcile in some form is a way of gaining hope and moving toward change. And I think that that's central to the story of people who have suffered a great deal. And with Eva's story that she came to it by, um, she was so angry for years and one could see, and you can see in some of the archival footage of Eva that she's ready to explode, to literally explode. And she mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. uh, at one point very publicly during a, a speech on Holocaust Remembrance Day that Elie Wiesel was giving in the rotunda of the, of the U.S. Capitol. And she couldn't take the lack of recognition that she saw for these children who had suffered these unspeakable experiments. And so it was, uh, she became a pariah for a while because she was so volatile. And eventually, um, through a set of circumstances that I talk about in the book, she was, in, she interviewed a doctor, a Nazi doctor, who had actually been at Auschwitz, but refused to be involved in the selection or any of that process, his job was to actually look through the peephole in the gas chambers to, to see if anybody was still moving. So he, 
he was willing to talk about as a medical authority what the Nazis were doing in the in Auschwitz and in the death camps. And he was the first doctor to ever write, you know, to sign his name to a legal affidavit saying this is what happened. And Eva wanted to do something to thank him for doing that. And so while she was doing dishes one evening, and actually after talking to um, a friend of hers who was an Indiana State University professor and translator for Eva, she was, uh, you know, it just struck her that she would forgive him. That that was the only thing that was really worth giving to him as somebody who had suffered so greatly and for someone who was involved in with the criminals. And that was the, the whole genesis of forgiveness for Eva. And then, of course, her translator, the professor said, well, you're forgiving this doctor, Hans Munch, but he was never actively involved in uh, your, your torture and your direct circumstances. So can you forgive Mengele? And the doctors and nurses and the, the guards and all of those that, that you had a personal experience of. And it is, as Eva would explain it, because forgiveness is not exoneration. It is a way of freeing your own soul and trying to move with, um, with hope and some joy into the rest of your life. And she, as she did this and met, met so many different people, uh, people that, who had suffered the genocide in Rwanda and rape victims and just so many people had suffered such terrible crimes in their own personal lives. And they saw Eva as someone who, who could, as a guide, um, to wait, there is a way not to ever forget what happened, to completely reckon, recognize it, but to reconcile with life. And she was uh, a real inspiration that way. One more break, and then we'll come back with the conclusion of the interview with Joe. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my uh, my interview with author Joe Lee. This is such a, a personal story, not only obviously for Eva, but then I, uh, in writing it, I would assume it would be a personal story for you. Is this something that you would ever consider doing another type of historical graphic novel of this sort? You know, I would. And I've thought about several different stories that um, I'd 
that have yet not been told in this kind of way that deal with other kinds of, you know, terrible historical injustices, some of which um, have, don't have the, the ending that Eva's story had. Um, but, and you know, the world is, as I say, this human experiment is often a, <laughs> boy, is it a tragic one and filled with um, that it's not just, um, you know, if we don't look at history that we are doomed to repeat it, but we just, we find new variations on it and are so wrapped up in some of the insanities of human thought. I was just recently, and in fact, my last editorial cartoon I did for the paper here in Bloomington, I was just so struck by what the Utah governor, Spencer Cox, um, stated when he vetoed the anti-transgender athlete bill um, that was to keep, you know, transgender girls from competing in school sports. And he just said that he didn't understand the issue completely, but when he doesn't understand something, he would always try to err on the side of compassion, mercy, and kindness. And I thought, wow, there is, there's where we should be mm-hmm. with what we don't understand. Well, and, yeah. uh, and, and I just thought, I thought that was inspirational. I don't know this. I can't make a judgment on it. But in any case, you know, compassion, mercy, and kindness are always the way to go forwards. Um, so it's, one keeps their eyes open to that in the, I've, I've always been intrigued by, uh, Charles McKay's 18th century book about the, uh, popular delusions and the madness of crowds is because we, we so easily become enamored and, uh, um, addicted to those kind of delusions. And, and very often they're incredibly dangerous. Uh, when one sees some of the, the things that have been put out by the QAnon uh, and the ideas of the blood sacrifice and, uh, that, and once again, finding ways to, to pull marginalized groups like Jews back in to this horrible whirlpool and to see even after all that we know that we humans slipping once again into that is it's frightening and but I think we have to hold on to what uh, the lawyer the founder of the Lynching Museum has said if we we have to keep hoping and working toward that that we are better than that yeah i I'm, I hope so <laughs> I mean you, you see it uh, but sometimes it's hard to remember um, are there any of your other writings that you would like to highlight at this point well there's um you know, this is certainly the the biggest story that I've worked on, I've, I've written and several other things. I've, I've written and illustrated quite a bit for the Four Beginners series of books and um, had written a, a book about Dante and the Divine Comedy. And I always like to say it was the first Divine Comedy with jokes. And then um, 
things that were well, like Greek mythology and the, the history of clowning and, and various things, all of which I think are very important subjects in their own way and help us in some way make sense of what sometimes is a, is a crazy, tragic existence. But it's, um, you know, and as I say, uh, certainly a book like Mouth is, uh, it is a very different story about a very similar event to, to Eva's. Um, and Art Spiegelman's parents, they don't survive it in the way that Eva and her sister and Eva's husband, Mickey, mm -hmm. were able to survive it. And it is like so many other stories that eventually the tragedy catches up. I had just recently been reading a book, kind of a science fiction, supernatural kind of thing about these authors like Primo Levi and, and different people who had suffered through the Holocaust. And after making and having successful careers after surviving, eventually the, the tragedy of it all uh, catches up with them and they ended their lives in suicide. So it's, um, there, there are so many stories. Um, I, as a kid, what really got me involved in storytelling in this way were the stories of the Knights of the Round Table. And at first, when I started reading them, I thought, oh, these are great stories of, of heroism and, you know, being the, the knight in shining armor. But so often, you can't separate the tragic circumstances from the heroism. And we seem to be forever trapped in that same, you know, the amber of where we become heroes because life can be so tragic. Um, so it's, I, don't know, I, I think one thing, you know, when I see, um, when they talk about an education being a lifelong learner is that everything you read or see or encounter, if you can't learn something from it, you just aren't paying enough attention. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. I, I, I was recently, I, I spoke to a, a group and the day before I had read, I read once a month to a kindergarten class. And if you ever want to feel like an important celebrity, read to a kindergarten class. Yep. <laughs> they, they think you are the, the greatest thing on earth. But if you need to be taken down a few notches. <laughs> read to a kindergarten class. <laughs> but also then read to a high school class. <laughs> or, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they, they can be. But anyway, the, this teacher, and of course, I most of the time I have seen her with a mask on. Because I and the kids, we were all masked. And when I would read the, the stories and but this. Um, so the time when I before there was a little girl who I don't know what had occurred, but she was having a real meltdown and was kicking over furniture and and throwing pencils and had to be taken gently but forcefully out of the room and I thought it's you know family circumstances the circumstances of pandemic the you know just the the things that whirl around us in the world so this last time when I went in just a, a week or so ago 
And here we were actually seeing each other's faces for the very first time. But all the, the kids were sitting on the floor as I sat, sit on a little rocking chair and read. And I saw this teacher, this um, young kindergarten teacher sitting on the floor with the kids and she was holding the hand of the little girl who had had the meltdown the last time. And the little girl was, she was calm. She listened. She was engaged. And I just thought, for me, that was an incredibly heroic act. That that young teacher sitting there, holding that, that little kindergartner's hand, who whatever circumstances were happening in her life, he was a human being offering her, you know, the compassion, mercy, and kindness. And it has its effect. And I was just, um, it's one of those things that if you keep your eyes open, we're lucky enough to witness. And if we can further those kind of experiences for others on those occasions that we can, even that small touch of a hand is, it's a heroic action that can change the world, if not the entire world, at least for one little kindergarten student. Which is sometimes all you could ask for, really, when you think about it. it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think of the, how lucky I've been in different situations. Quite often when my uh, naivete or stupidity have gotten me into that I have been, you know, that I've been saved by the kindness of strangers, as Blanche Dubois would say. Absolutely. Because... Um a graphic novel is, is a different way of writing and a different way of presenting an idea because you've got the visual along with the, with the written. Do you have advice for maybe aspiring graphic novelists? Well, I actually uh, was asked to come up with 10 points <laughs> about that for a piece, the a little piece that I wrote um, at, for um, a writer's magazine. And you know, the first thing is you know, find something that really moves you to do it. Because if you are going to spend a hundred pages or more draw writing and drawing and, you know, and all the research that goes into that, it better be something you really are personally moved or involved in um mm -hmm. so if you say if you you're not interested in growing soybeans in the midwest don't do a graphic novel about it that's going to you know take up a lot <laughs> of time and effort <laughs> you know but if you do like soybeans hey give it a shot so there is there's that um and to, um, you know, to fall in love in some way with the subject, even a tragic subject, um, that because you're going to need that. You're going to need that to move you sometimes when, especially with a tragic story, that you think, boy, I don't want to go there. I don't want to push that. But, but you've got to see some, you know, even a smaller but greater purpose to go ahead and do it. So there's that. And there's also, um, you have to be able to, this is one thing that I would always uh, tell kids, teaching cartooning, that, you know, cartooning is, it's, it isn't the same as taking a photograph or illustration isn't. you you get a chance to focus on what you really want to say. And the only mistake that you can make is if you are trying to show something, like say you've got a person sitting at a table drinking a cup of coffee. 
if your skill can't convey that they are holding a coffee cup and instead it looks like, you know, they're trying to devour a horse. That's the only mistake you can make. So you have to think just the way you would in writing a story. If I say it was a sunny day and I can't in some way portray that visually, then maybe I should find some other direction. So you've got to be able to, to say things in an illustration that people can read. Um, and th that's, that's really important. It's an ambition is we get ideas and not everybody can draw like Leonardo. But if you want to tell a story visually, you may not have to draw like Leonardo, but you've got to draw enough like yourself that somebody know, can understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's so many different ways of doing it. Um, what I did was I wanted to show as directly as I could, you know, these these children, the the Nazis, the various characters, the the later experience, in as realistic a way I as I could. But a book like Mouse, where he takes this leap to take that. Um, old cartoon trope by showing the Jews as mice and the um, Nazis as cats. And something that is, you know, we, we are so familiar with that uh, trope that you don't even really need to explain any further. Mm -hmm. And so there are very, there are all kinds of different ways, but find one that you can, you can stay true to and you can do over multiple pages. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of internet presence, uh, if you have a website, can you share that as well as any social media that you might be um, able for or available for people to interact with you on? Well, at the moment I am, I'm not exactly. <laughs> Uh, the most public social media person, but I am I um, am having my website rebuilt, and hopefully that will be done sometime in the next couple of months. Um, but probably the easiest place to find me is you can certainly look at, and you can find books I've illustrated in, in various projects I, I've done on Amazon. Um, as I say, I've done a lot for the beginners series. You can go for four beginners books, for beginners publishing their website and see work. I also have a site on Etsy and, um, and then Red Lightning Books that published this. So that, those are probably the easiest ways to find me. Um, I do have a uh, Facebook page, which um, I, I should go to more often, but if anybody wants to contact me through Facebook Messenger, if you find the Joe Lee, whose photograph looks like Groucho Marx, um, that's me. So. <laughs> some people are going to get that and some people aren't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but... Um, so, yeah, Groucho's always been a, one of my heroes in his way. And um, so that was so there are various ways. But I will as soon as I I do get my website up, I will let you know and then, um, if you get an opportunity to, to spread it. I know I um, it has, as we all know, we've had a couple of strange years um yes we have and you know there have been all kinds of new ways of personal connection and, and disconnection and so it's um i think we've all just had to learn all kinds of new things it's a work in progress in a lot of ways yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so and also they could go to the bloomington herald times 
and they do, you know, I publish a cartoon with them weekly. So I'm in okay. a Sunday paper and they, they archive some of those. So, okay. Sounds anyways, good. I'm out there in various places. Um, and occasionally you can come across a photograph or two of me as um, Jungle Joe of Jungle Joe's Flea Circus, a performance I still do. Or um, I also have a, a one-man clown show I do called the Cirque de Jolais. <laughs> so <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Well, Joe, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to me today. I, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Sarah. It is, it's been, I, in, you know, I'm very much involved in, in talking about this story, but it's been wonderful meeting you and chatting. Wonderful meeting you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you once again to Joe for taking the time not only to talk to me about this this graphic novel, but also to to write it, to draw it, to put so much heart and soul into the story um, so that people can learn about Eva. Um, as I was reading through it, I was I was doing, you know, I was just doing a little Googling as well. And so getting some more of the background and more of the, the backstory, um, learning more about some history that I'm familiar with, but can always learn more about. So thank you to Joe for that. Um, Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners, for joining me. Um, Next time, if you join me for the next episode, I'll be discussing Cat's Whisker, a novel by Robert Stephen Goldstein. It's... um it's science, it's spirituality, it's um, got a lot of qualities of a memoir, but it's a novel. So join me for that conversation with Robert on the next episode. In the meantime, if you are a fan of this podcast, please do me the favor, the honor um, of leaving a review. Uh, that is oh, so very helpful. You have no idea. It can be written, it can be starred, either one works to get the podcast out to more listeners. But also, if you're not doing so already, um, make sure you follow the podcast so you get new episodes whatever podcast platform you like to listen on and also follow us on social media facebook twitter instagram and tiktok i love hearing from listeners let me know what you're reading what you want to read if you've been buried under your tbr yet you know all those good things uh inquiring nosy podcasters want to know so let me know in the meantime i hope you're having a really good week uh it's may already holy buckets it's may 3rd um i hope your may is going so so far so good and um i hope that not only your day but your week and your whole month of may involves plenty of time for you to get yourself lost in a good book thank you so much You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.